that story was told trying to get through the idea of having to deal with this my whole life about being forgetful and people get mad at you for being forgetful and you get mad at yourself for being forgetful and they give you these I guess strategies that work for people that aren't forgetful like I, I mean I'll forget my wallet next to me I'll forget my phone if I at a restaurant you know once a month or something so my mom will always say I love her she's amazing we'll always be like, you got to get a checklist I'm like we well, got to check the checklist ADHD Rewired Episode 102. This is the show designed to help those of us who have really good intentions and a slightly wandering attention. My name is Eric Tivers. I'm a licensed clinical social worker, coach, and consultant. We know that starting can be the hardest part, so let's get started. But first, let me thank our sponsors. Support for this podcast comes from Audible. For a free audiobook download, go to ericktivers.com slash audible for a link for that free download and for some hand-picked recommendations. Go to ericktivers.com slash audible for your free audiobook download. Hey everyone, before we get started with the interview, just a few things. Last week's episode with Diane Dempster received a lot of feedback, so thank you for that. But if you listened and noticed that I actually was not part of the conversation, there was a, a mixing problem. Anyways, it was fixed. Go back, delete episode 101 and re-download it, and you'll hear the episode as it was intended. And thank you to all of you who emailed and messaged me on Facebook to let me know. We've got some amazing interviews coming up this month, including the former drummer of Silverchair, Sean Winchester, and a U.S. medal-winning Paralympian with ADHD who runs, plays baseball, cycles, and is completely blind, Tanner Gears. Also, in coming weeks, I'm going to be introducing a new mini-segment that is going to take one story and bring it to you week after week. Any serial fans out there? What is it going to be all about? Well, you'll have to tune in to hear it. And now that I've put that out there, I just made myself accountable to really do it. Speaking of accountability, both sections for the ADHD Rewired Coaching and Accountability Group are officially full. If you want to sign up for the next session, which will begin end of April, beginning of May, sign up before March 1st, and you, my friend, will lock in the lowest possible price that will be offered. Details are at coachingrewired.com. And as a final note about this episode, my guest, Alex Hofeld, talks about how he's always wanted to do a podcast. When we recorded this interview on December 22nd, 2015, he was talking about it, and it was just an idea. But now his podcast, Beautiful Dust Specs, which I'm going to play a clip at the very end for you, is now available on iTunes. And let me tell you, it is extraordinary. It's just, it's action-packed right out of the gate. It's about science and it's totally ADHD, but awesome. So check it out. Um, One more thing, because there's always one more thing, right? Um, I know that there are probably some of you right now who are thinking, oh my God, get on with the interview. And that's cool. That's fine. I know you're out there because some of you emailed me to let me know when during this part of the podcast gets a little long winded, which is great. I appreciate hearing from you. But here's the thing. Podcasts don't cost you anything, but they do take time and money to produce. So if you're interested in a commercial free announcement free version of this podcast, head on over to ADHDrewired.com and send me a note letting me know that you'd be interested in, for a small monthly fee, a premium feed. It's just an idea. If you're interested in it, let me know. Curious to know how many people would be interested in something like that. All right, now I'm really done. Here's the interview. Welcome back to another episode of ADHD Rewired. I am here for the first time in not the virtual studios, but the actual ADHD Rewire Studios. I have in my office Alex Hofelt. He is a high school science teacher, a certified yoga instructor, a coach, a jock nerd. Is that, is that a hyphenated nerd title? Jock, sure. Nerd jock, jock. nerd, whatever you like. <laughs> 
And I met Alex uh, presenting to his high school um, earlier this year on ADHD. Uh, and we're going to talk a little bit about that and a number of other things, including mindfulness and your mom and dad and whatever we end up talking about. Alex, welcome. Thanks, welcome, man. Welcome to my office. Yeah, it's super cool. I'm excited to be here. I'm a voracious podcast listener, and this has always been a dream to be on one. And I've really liked your show, and so it'll be great. And uh, yeah, we really connected at that speech I like. So it'll be it'll be fun to to join you here and see where we take the conversation. So during uh, the presentation that I gave uh, during one of the breaks, you came up to me and shared a, a great a story. And I asked you, I said, would you mind sharing that with that uh, with your colleagues? And um, which is a very kind of daring thing to, to do. Um, although I'm not sure that Alex really thought of it as like, OK, sure, fine. So Alex, will you share with listeners what uh, story it was that I asked you to the share? The tragic spinach story. <laughs> So I was just, uh, you were giving the speech and teachers are a tough audience and not all of them deal with um, a high percentage of kids who have struggles like this, like you were talking about. And your speech was connecting with me and I'm never afraid to public speak. That school knows me. I'm I'm more comfortable speaking in front of people than I am like dancing, you know, like it's just something I'm just good at. So I thought I'd share the story with you to try and drive home a point. But the tragic, I think it's tragic. The story is that I had to get spinach for a photosynthesis lab. It's a cool lab. So they gave me the responsibility of getting the spinach, and I'm thinking like, okay, all right, I got to focus. I got to do this knowing that I forget stuff. Morning, I woke up, spinach is in the fridge. I get it out of the fridge. I think, go put it in your car because you'll totally forget it in the next hour that I leave, knowing me pretty well. And I'm like, nah, nah, I don't want to go outside. It's cold. So I'll put it in front of the door, right? You can't you can't miss something. You put it in front of the door. Makes morning sense. goes, <laughs> yeah. Morning goes by. I do my thing. All of a sudden, I'm walking out. I'm like, here we go. Time to school. Teach up the kids trip, slam into the door. And I look back, I think, man, that's dangerous. And I go to school. I just walk on, go to my car. Don't even think twice about it. I get into the school. I look at my co-teacher and she's like, where's the spinach? I'm like, oh my God, I, I kicked it. I mean, I, I literally kicked it. So that story was told trying to get through the idea of having to deal with this my whole life about being forgetful. And people get mad at you for being forgetful. And you get mad at yourself for being forgetful. And they give you these I guess strategies that work for people that aren't forgetful. Like, I, I mean, I'll forget my wallet next to me. I'll forget my phone if I at a restaurant, you know, once a month or something. So my mom will always say, "I love her. She's amazing." We'll always be, like, "You got to get a checklist." I'm like, "We well, got to check the checklist." Like, and I was trying to get through the idea that it's almost not even forgetting. You 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 don't forget it over and over. It's just gone. It's just not there. There was no from the time I put the bag down till I did my morning till I drove to school, not another moment of my brain was spent thinking about the spinach leaves. But then as soon as it goes, you're just like, oh my God. So I just wanted to get through to that to where anyone who thinks like, just get better at it or just overcome it or stop forgetting, it's, it's, there's a glitch. There's like a glitch in the matrix when it comes to that. And it's, you get, it's frustrating, but I just wanted to try and show people that it's, it, it's almost out of your control, but I hate saying that because it sounds like a weakness, but it's, it's a rough, it's a rough thing that I've dealt with for a long, long time. Mm. And I seem to remember too, when you were, uh, when you first were, were kind of opening the story, when you're sharing this with your colleagues, um, you said that you started your story by saying, you know, this, this may come to, as a surprise to everyone, <laughs> but, uh, I think you said like over the summer I was officially diagnosed with ADHD and I think the uh, the general response out of everybody there was a very loud, sarcastic, no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm kind of, I guess, notorious is the right word for that. My my co-teacher laughed the hardest. I work with a lady named Dana, who's just wonderful. Um, she keeps me sane, and she'll always tell me about this, that. And it's just little things. I'm a very high-energy person. I always have been to the point, you know, being self-perspective now in later life, I, I might be detrimental to some of my relationships like i'm a little too much to handle sometimes but in what way what is it what does that look I, like? I don't sit still well like i'm i'm you know fitness yoga all this stuff i mean even that journey of becoming a yoga instructor everything about me is on the fringes to where i can't just do something halvesies i go all the all all into it i mean crossfit was one thing where i started a little while back and within a year i was a coach and then i've done yoga forever and it was then i'm a coach it's just i can't i always want to know more but the older i get the more of an appetite I have for that. However, I don't know if everyone always wants that. Some people are more content with just, you're, you're okay at it, like relax. And then, you know, bouncing feet, shaky pacing, wandering. If 
I get really excited on a topic, I have a tendency to, I don't want to use, everyone says obsessive, I say passionate, but it, it probably can get a little manic. I mean, I can get I can get going and get pretty excited with a little high voice going on and stuff. So <laughs> yeah, I think, plus I'm, I'm, I'm probably, again, to a fault, very open with who I am. And so I've worked there for eight years and I, I like relationships. I like the people I work with. So they, they know me. They, and it was more of the, you know, the guys are always razzing me and stuff. But yeah, it was fun. Yeah, they weren't, they weren't shocked. And what I thought was really neat was uh, I think you were kind of like the catalyst at at uh, your school for kind of sharing. And then there were a few other teachers that also shared. And, you know, I I, I presented schools and that was a rarity. Mm-hmm. So I just thought that was really um, it, it was it was a really nice thing to see that people were, were willing to share their stories and, and connect to it in a very in a much more real way. Because, you know, we we know that there are still teachers who look at, you know, ADHD and they'll use their air quotes to be like, yeah, it's just some of an excuse for why they're not turning in their homework. But it's like when you realize, you know, this is this is real. And and your colleagues who are doing really good things are also sharing this stuff with, with you. It's um, I think it makes it more real. And so I just think that's just an important element of uh, understanding what the hell this ADHD thing is all about. Mm-hmm. I mean, the, the, your brain is a, it's a lock box, right? I mean, I was think I was pondering today the idea of like what is normal in there. And so it, it's just like anything. I remember in college, it was depression. Not for me, but thinking you're in control of your emotions, man. Just pick to be happy. And then I had a, a couple of roommates who really struggled with it. And it hit, hit closer to home later in life. So I think until you realize, you know, you really can't, you just have to just accept the fact that if you can't experience it personally, you have to accept the fact that it's out there. And that's a challenge for some people who, mm-hmm. you know, as teachers, we think of it all the time, like just overcoming the adversity where, which is not an invalid statement for a lot of our students. Like some of them don't strive to overcome it. They just, I guess, embrace it, whatever you want to say. But at the same time, though, you there's got to be a middle ground. There's got to be some, some can't always bang a square peg into a round hole every single day where, so I was just trying to show the people that there are various shapes of holes out there i guess <laughs> you know it makes me kind of think about um when trying to to help others kind of understand what it might be like and for for people who were just you know the there's like yeah they, don't, they just have a hard time with with accepting it mm-hmm. you know i think about okay so as social human beings Part of our social brain is supposed to be able to, um, we have what's called the theory of mind. We have a theory of what somebody else's uh, inner thoughts, feelings, ideas. We understand that their thoughts and feelings are going to be different than our thoughts and feelings. That's called theory of mind. So my, my kind of curious question is, for people who say that they don't believe in you know, whether it's ADHD or even just any mental illness, is it that they're too scared to like say, you know, to, to go down that path to imagine how much is a thought experiment to, to say, OK, I'm going to imagine that that this is an actual thing, even though I've never maybe experienced it and just imagine what it would be like. I just it, it's. I find it frustrating sometimes that people have such a hard time. That some people have a hard time just accepting that some, like the whole idea of neurodiversity, that some people are going to see the world and experience things differently than you because of the way your brain is wired. So I just, I think it's a really kind of interesting that you're talking about um, just the perspective of depression or just you're having your mood. And that was kind of, um, that brought me down that rabbit hole. Yeah. Cause it, it goes into the whole thing of normal where uh, I guess I could talk about it, you know, the medication and stuff where, it feels way different when you're on it. But then I'm part of, part of me is thinking like, well, is it feel so weird because this is not normal to me? Like, is this normal? Like, am I now feeling normal, you know, as opposed to what I felt before? And how do you know that? Right. I mean, it's just the word normal. Is it even useful? Cause it's just, it's just a perspective on a universe of understanding inside our brain that, you know, it's like, I'm also colorblind and that's a huge thing that people just, yeah, yeah. People just fixate on it. Like the what's the color of this game? And I always joke sometimes, like maybe you're colorblind, but how do you even know? You have no idea. Like I, I can try and explain to you how I get colors mixed up, and then they instantly think I'm like monochromatic. And I'm like, no, I don't see grays. I, I see I'm, blue's my favorite color. 
Blue's also what I have the hardest time deciphering from purple, you know, and so people just think it's this comical thing, but they can't, they're fascinated by it, but I don't know how to relate it to you. Well, I'm, I'm a sli- it's probably a more technical word for it. I'm slightly colorblind in one eye, mm-hmm. but it's, it's just all relative. Yeah. I'm not sure which eye it is because I'll go like, you know, I'm, go- <laughs> I'm going, oh, you know, it's like remember Wayne's World, camera one, yeah, camera yeah. two. And so like one eye has, a, I see like tints differently. Yeah. It's crazy. It's basically yeah. audio. As I'm just sitting here, like going, <laughs> winking, winking. <laughs> and they have the, the new the new Google glasses now come out. And my mom's like adamant, like you have to go get them. And there's a part of me that's weirded out by it. I'm like, what will it look like? Like I can't. It's probably no big deal. But you know, there's just like I've been like this my entire life, and it doesn't that. I mean, I'll, I'll wear some awkward outfits every once in a while. And I had a, I had a rough couple of weeks here at school where I was wearing two shirts I thought were blue. Turned one turned out to be gray. One was purple and. In my mind, it was definitely my blue shirt. And so, you know, every once in a while, I get some weird, weird outfits. But I just don't go shopping by myself. I'll have to ask the lady, does this match? And, you know, she'll giggle at me because I tell her I'm colorblind. But it's just that whole idea of, like, I can't relate. I can't tell you what it is. People are so fascinated by it. But I, just, I usually just tell people that I just don't know what matches. Yeah. So, like, yeah. does this match? Like, I just, I just have no, like, I, I, you know, to me, it looks like it should go together. Yeah, totally. And then, I'll, you know, someone will tell me, like, that, that doesn't go. It's like... I, I don't know. I just don't get Everyone it. Every once just embrace it. You're just like, ah, whatever. I'm wearing blue shirt, blue shoes, and a purple shirt today. This is happening. Yeah, you know, like, get on board, kids. So I, I stick in the the, uh, the the earth tone color family because it's like pretty much you can't screw that up no matter what. So it's. <laughs> I like gray pants because gray pants can go with whatever. And like, uh, I know I'm, I'm with you on that one. I like the bright colors though. So um, you were telling me, you know, so you're you're pretty open about about your ADHD. Um, but you were also saying that your parents have kind of said to you, uh, just t- tell us what your parents have said to you. They just, they they were, they got a little weirded out where, I don't know, I probably shouldn't have, maybe it's too open, but I, I put it on Facebook, like, which was probably dumb. They Looking back, I was a little silly and they just got weirded out. They They told me I should keep it closer to the vest, but I think it comes from a place of knowing that I'm probably too communicative and too open sometimes to where I can, I can talk myself into corners. I don't think they meant it maliciously, but they just meant it as like, someone could think of that as a weakness so why not just keep it close to your close to your vest but for me then that's not how i deal with questions like i really enjoyed your group because i like being able to ask questions in a group setting and i think so much stuff in society could be fixed or helped better with more open openness about it but it just it your parents they it psychs you out and i love my parents to death they're like and, and my just so listeners and, know you're talking about i i run the the, the uh, chad of northern illinois um so if you are local third monday of every month um just look us up yeah i'll be back so and, they they just talked about it and it just it just really wor- worried me where it was more about for at the time i was very upset by it because it was just i'm trying to get stuff in line you know like you're trying to finally take control of this and looking back it probably had a pretty impactful you know, throughout life and relationships and other, just simply from forgetting things to being me in school and stuff, which I was never bad. I was in honors and AP classes, but I was very cool just being the 80% kid, like probably could have gotten straight A's, but eh, pump the brakes teachers, you know. Will, will you share the story that you shared last night about math and what you did in like a math class? And oh kind God, of- fourth grade. This is, this is serious. This will be on my deathbed is probably one of the biggest mistakes <laughs> so or any, ripple effects of my life. You have some areas of giftedness, right? Yeah. That- I, I, I think of myself as a smart person. Sure. I, I'm, I don't know. I've ne- honestly, I've never really flexed the muscles as hard as I could have been, you know, looking back now, I know this. Uh, math was an issue in fourth grade. Uh, I kind of remember the setting and I kind of don't. They, story goes, I mean, it was so out of, out of body, out of mind for me. I'm a kid. I didn't know. The story goes is that it was a placement test back in the day, even more so now where they did, it was, there were four levels of math, very remedial, you know, bottom, intermediate, and then the advanced. And I was always in the advanced classes. I was always in the smart classes with the smart kids and whatever, you know, however you want to think of that. They gave us the test and told us that it's not for a grade. And I don't remember thinking it. I was I was young, but I must have just filled it out and just went and shot hoops. And then as time goes by, I get placed in my class. And I'm in a small class setting. I, me- I remember it. I remember being a small class setting. I remember being with students I normally weren't in class with. And I remember thinking it's very slow. But I was also thinking, man, I am good at math. Like, I am crushing this. <laughs> so I kept going, oh, I'm talking to my mom. I'm like, I'm doing great. I'm doing great. And then finally, she tells me, I told her that I'm, I'm so smart at this, I'm teaching the classroom. My mom is a high school teacher as well. She actually teaches special ed math. Math teach. They're they're retired. My dad was a science teacher. Mom was special ed, but mainly a home ec for twenty five years at Grand High School. So she just goes, "Oh my God, he's in remedial math class." 
<laughs> and fast forward, she called the school, pulled strings, got me back into regular or to the advanced class with my like normal friends, normal group of kids. And air, air quotes on yeah, normal. right. <laughs> and I, I never, I never recovered. I was way behind because it was a couple months. And being the kid I just described to you, I was not a overcoming adversity kid. I was a, I'm bad at math. And my whole life, I mean, the story culminates with having a bad score on my ACT. Like, I don't want to talk about it. Real bad. Um, compared uh, to my uh, other scores. Like, but you know, when you tell me you don't want to talk about it now, I'm like, how bad? I bad i got i was very i was in i was in college level reading when i was like a sophomore i'm I'm really good at reading i'm good at speaking uh so i got really good math science i think reading all i'm sorry i forgot all the act ones now anyways i was thinking i was in the teens in math okay so it ended up where my senior year of high school actually i dropped out in our normal classes and i went and retook regular algebra or at the honors level because as an as it sounds terrible as a teacher talking about this but it's the reality now knowing this you're in an honors class versus a regular. An honors kid in math, in everything but math for me, was blown away by the progression and the kids in normal math, which sounds terrible. But these kids would take bets on how long they could keep them off task. And I remember one guy gave the, kid, gave the teacher the finger and like swore at him. And I remember thinking like, they're going to kill him. Like, you know, oh my God, like this, <laughs> they're going to they're gonna take him to the office and literally this kid will never come back. And he just left. And I'm thinking like, Oh my God, you can do that? Like, you know, I wasn't that kid at all. So the pace, the speed, the whatever, all of it. So you just, probably go to your, your honors friends. Right? Yeah, to- oh, you completely. You should see completely. The regular classes are awesome. Chaos. I remember thinking it was, it terrified me. It was, it was scary. And I knew oh, I wasn't so learning much. And then you then, with your ACT score, permeates into college. I transferred all over the place. I was on a golf scholarship. I was a, tried to be a pro skier, blah, blah, blah. And in that, you always had to take the placement math test, always. And it, they would not let you out of it. And I'd be getting like hundreds, and I'm telling them. And so I had to take, I, I'd had to been, uh, whatever, $20,000, dollars in wasted credits over my six, seven years of college taking this stupid placement math test. Mixed now with science teacher, I'd love to teach physics. Physics gets me way more stoked than biology, but there's no way. I, I don't, unless I went out and sat down for a year with Khan Academy, I mean, I would struggle with the math, so... It's been a. It was a huge regret. Knowing now, I could have learned it. I mean, I could have just buckled down and learned so the, it. So this decision that you made in in third, third or fourth grade, yeah. fourth grade, had this huge financial impact. Huge, <laughs> huge. You had no idea, no idea. Wow. Not only that, just it, it just looking like I I was so hindered. It was just a hindering thing, and it it really. I was that kid. I was. The, I hate math. Math. Math's terrible. Math. This. Math. That. And like, I just didn't. It was awful. So uh, there's two thoughts I have. Um, one, so, you know, telling me about this whole secret society of honors classes <laughs> so that I've never stepped foot in, in my entire life. Because uh-huh. I was always in, like, my classes were either the, the quote-unquote, the normal or the the slower classes. I was in, in the, the, you know, the not normal uh, math classes, like the slower ones. The, my, I remember my chemistry. I had, to, I had to retake high school chemistry. Um, and I was, hard. I went in, I remember like every single morning to, to work with my teacher and I barely pulled out the C, mm-hmm. you know, it's like, it just didn't make sense to me. Like they're balancing equations. Like even now is a little bit of geometry. Tra- there's a little bit of trauma. You want to think about it. I'm just <laughs> like, Oh my God. Like the anxiety is You'd probably surprise yourself. You'd probably be able to handle it more than you, than you think now. Uh, no. uh, I remember when I had to take my, uh, my, um, certification test to be a, to my, cause I have my certification for school, my school social work. Um, cause you know, you never know how often in, as a, as a social worker, I mean, I need to know long division. I mean, it's, and I had to reteach myself those things. And I like, I had to reteach myself how to borrow numbers and subtraction. Yeah. Like I'm real special when it comes to, to math. Like, I'm just like, oh my gosh, my brain just does not do that. And my, my son who's four is like amazing at math. Like he does not get any of that for mm-hmm. me. Yeah. You can't relate <laughs> to it. I, I don't, it's like, it's like a musical person. Like yeah. music just makes sense to people. Numbers make sense. But I mean, I can ponder the universe with the best of them, but. It just yeah, numbers just do not stick with me. And but looking, learning it, having to take having a bachelor's degree in bio, you got to take physics. And having to go through that, my sister helped me a ton. Having to go through that shows that I I probably could have buckled down a little harder. And it wasn't as daunting as I thought it was. But yeah, it was it was an issue. I mean that the you don't you don't know the ripple effects in life until the ripple effects happen, right? I mean that's yeah, that's life. Yeah. But um, the the other thought I was having when you about this test that you the the 
the decision of fourth grade, the probably come up with some better, you know, over dramatic, you know, title for that story. <laughs> um, I, I remember seeing the Simpsons episode where he like fills out, um, I'm trying to remember what he filled it in the bubbles or he just made some like word. And I'm pretty sure I also did that in like one of those standard ass tests. Cause I was like, this is like so boring. Yeah. You know, it comes to like word problems and it's like, oh my gosh, it's like the, the, the brain immediately shuts down as soon as I see word problems. That's your, your, that you're the majority. Like that's just, <laughs> like I, it blows my mind as a teacher sometimes. And I, I think I, I don't remember struggling with those. I think I actually was okay with those because my reading comprehension was good. But yeah, kids, kids are allergic to word problems, but the standardized testing is testing in general is just a trip. Like we just got done with finals and. I don't know. I'm sure some of my teacher friends will listen to this. I, I just hate finals. I, I mean, one out of 90 kids' grades improves from finals. It's like they're going through the, the semester, padding their grade for n- having the grade stay or go down during finals. And, I, and you know, you watch, we proctor the ACT and all this, and kids like me who weren't diagnosed with ADD or any sits puts, like, that's a four and a half hour test, you know? And we as science teachers always wonder because the science is the last portion. It's the hardest one most kids say and it's like it's at the end of a four-year that's a marathon of sitting you know and focusing and how geez i I just it just seems like you're setting them up for failure for that again i don't have the answers to the opposite of it or anything i can just complain from the outside but i mean (laughs) it's easier to do right yeah just final finals just stress me out it's the worst day as a teacher for me is sitting putting the grades in us watching the grades just go down or up or oh and you it just it just sucks you were sharing a story about um i think it was like Filling out the like the answer rubric mm. and how, how how hard that is for you. My teachers are gonna laugh at me for these. So. <laughs> well, I, I there have been so many times I remember as a student where you have the scantron, you know, it's a fifty question test, and back on question twelve, I skipped question twelve. Oh yeah, not intentionally. I get to the end of the test, I'm like fifty one. Crap. And then so you have to go back and so you're, I, you're lucky you at least checked it. Most of us turn it in. I didn't know there was a back page. Oh yeah, there yep, yeah, there was. Or what what about <laughs> the um the you ever get the assignment where uh the, the assignment the whole idea is about paying attention to directions and the teacher says like make sure you read all the questions first and it's like you have to answer three questions and the last question is on, on the the thing your teacher gives you is do questions one five and then put your name on it and turn it in i was a kid that was the last one to turn it in like how does everyone finish these things so quickly and it's like that was like the story of my life i stopped doing that it's like a day one thing we do to kids i stopped doing because some kids just give you these squinty eyes like like oh, you're already mad at me day one so yeah no i know i know those we have those worksheets for sure they're funny yeah the 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 answer keys are rough it, for me it's an answer key as a test and i don't know the the one who we, i struggle with this we she she does it and she does it well and she's great at it and i i beg and plead for her to let me <laughs> use her key cuz it's it's just time consuming to where i'll do whatever it takes if you can fill out the key because i know i'll make two mistakes on it and then i'll have to go back and hand grade everything and it just as opposed to she's good at it she'll she'll oh, fill it out man. great and i'll 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 make it up for later but it's, I mean, it's, it's a weakness. It's, it's whatever it is. It's, it's a strength that I try. And even if I sit down and focus, there's, there's usually one or two. And for me, it just frustrates me because it's putting me in a position where I know I'm going to waste time where I could do something. Can you just like hire one of your like students from last year? So hey, I'll give you 10 bucks if you yeah. just do this for me. Oh, I mean, it's even like copying down. It, the answers are there. Just putting out, it's, it's ridiculous. No, it's, it's ridiculous it's, that I screw it up. Well, if we look at what the mental process is, that the cognitive process of, of copying information from one source to another, what we're dealing with is a bunch of quick attention shifting working memory tasks, mm-hmm. you know? And so it's like, if you have 50 of those, that's 50 opportunities to, where you have to do something that the ADHD brain is, you know, we, we know we're not just, we're yeah. not good at. You know, it's like whenever when I, I actually learned uh, when I first started my my practice that I have uh, dyscalculia, which is like it, it, um, it's like dyslexia with numbers. Oh, you talked about that at your speech. I remember. Yeah. And the only reason I learned it because I kept trying to enter credit card numbers into my credit card machine and I would enter it like four five, six times. And we keep seeing invalid number invalid. I was like, what? And I asked my wife, I'm like, we put this in and she would do it. And then I would ask her, we just watch me do this. And so I discovered that I would like if there was a series of numbers, especially if there was a repeating number. So if there was like a four eight eight nine, 
I would repeatedly put that in as like four eight nine nine. Hmm. Weird. Yeah, yeah. that's interesting. The brain. I don't know. <laughs> mine does. My my only my only D I ever got in school was uh, statistics. I don't even know what that guy's name was. If you're still listening, I I hated you. You were a terrible <laughs> teacher. Yeah, he was just one of the nastiest teachers I ever met. But if you remember, did you ever take stats? Remember, I did. it's like the building problem. There. I did. So every every unit, you're learning step twenty of this twenty step problem. He would give no partial credit. So if you screwed up finding the derivative or whatever, I don't remember it, it of step three, he'd put a big red X through it, and you could go to him and be like, "I got all this, and that I cannot, I can't do that." Like math was math because I made stupid mistakes. My whole and I have terrible handwriting. I mean, you name it. And that was just that class set me up for failure, and I got a D. That was the the only D I ever got in my entire life. I almost failed. I mean, I was I was lucky to pass that class, and that guy was just he was what was he? It was just what was he trying to prove? I just didn't get it. And so I took stats. I took stats twice because the first the first time I got a grade of he got to try this again. <laughs> <laughs> so my second time around, I got a. I, a very unearned C. So I took it at, a, at CLC, a community college, with a teacher who was still learning the English language. Oh, there you go. And would confuse words that, you know, they're small words like is and isn't, which changes the meaning of everything he's saying. Mm-hmm. And on the final exam, we he passes out the exam and then he leaves the room and we're going through the exam and all of a sudden like we notice that the answer key is stapled oh, to the no. back uh-huh. of it. and so people are kind of looking around and you hear this like mummer of like is this supposed to no one said anything like a social experiment he's setting you up for or right, because like it was like he i think he knew he was an awful teacher like because it was like it was very frustrating, yeah. you know. It's like because he knew that he what he was confusing us because of his he didn't know English uh-huh. well enough. So I don't know if it was like if that's like that's it's how peace I got, offering. It, that's how I <laughs> I passed statistics. Wow. But when I was in grad school and took research methods, which is applied statistics, yeah. I loved it. Yeah. Like because I'm like, oh, here's the why. Like this is the application for you know. It's like why do you need to know this? Here's why. Mm-hmm. Isn't this cool? Because you can you know predict and project information based on these kinds of things. I just I always wished that when I was in school that they can give me the why for for that those the things like math. Why do I need to know this? Yeah. You know, for some of it, it probably is not much of a good answer, but there probably yeah, it, is for tough. most things. It's that, tough. Like, yeah. yeah. It, it's for for me as a science teacher, it, it's very difficult, and that's the wonder of the whole thing. Where I mean, I can't tell you. It has to be a solid nine out of ten. Is like, oh, you're a teacher. Cool. What do you teach? Science. Which one? Biology. Oh God, I hated biology. Like you know, <laughs> down the road because it was just memorization. It, it really was. But what got me stoked in science from a young age was my dad. Like my dad was a biology and chemistry teacher, and being in the woods and looking at that and the relationships. And I remember hydrochloric acid in my stomach. That was number one where I got stoked on. I don't. I was little, and so. For a teacher, for me, what I'm doing it is I'm I want my main goal is to get you stoked on science. I mean, more so than anything, which is not your mission as a teacher. Your mission is the standardized tests and stuff. But if a kid, wait, uh, I have to interrupt. Really? Well, like, I would as, think as like, like funding, right? And, I mean, I'm I'm talking like globally. You're like what you're judged on, I guess, right? Okay. You know what you're judged on is your test scores, and judge is a strong word. People are on our side. Our administration's not out to get us or anything, but. You know, like funding, you know, No Child Left Behind was just over term, but all that stuff. And as opposed to just, you know, I have a C student who now just loves science versus maybe an A student who just paid it. What's the answer? You know, like that. That's that's the big paradigm that I always find in teaching versus the because I was the kid who loved the concepts, loved the I love science. We'll we'll always and forever love science. I did not want to sit down and memorize. So I got my B. You know, I was like, eh, I get it. I get it enough. You know, it's right. And then so <laughs> as like the, the what, the why. For me, that that's what I'm trying to get through to you in my science class is trying to get through to you. Like we were talking about earlier, the in terms of my mindfulness practice and stuff, is the the more layers you peel back in science, the more intricacy you learn about just your body alone, let alone the world and the universe. It makes me pumped. It makes me stoked. That's what I try and convey to the kids. That's not really on the test, though. You know, that's that's not like why Mr. Ofalt ran for ten minutes about this. You know, it's it's more. The content driven, and then time plays a big modality. We just have to crush through content so quickly. But yeah, the the why is is there, and 
you just don't i think even if we explain it to you as a, you know young eric probably wouldn't grasp it you know like for science teachers we're teaching out of th- i'd probably say you're stupid yeah right like <laughs> you know which is fine which is i was too but you're not realizing that your teacher's teaching you to be a lifelong learner right. you're not realizing that your teacher's per- laying out the units to give you a progressive viewpoint of the overall subject it's just that test is done moving on to the next gets out you know and that, which is school it, you have it's to all, to stay sane right you know i i think it's such a disservice that when a student fails a, an exam that we just move on like they should be able not only should they be able to retake it they should be required to retake it until they can show that they know it the, the challenge comes into play there is that you have to trust the kid that they're, this sounds bad, but you have to trust the kid that they're trying. And so many of these kids at times, sometimes I feel like they're defeated. And that's where I run into a wall where I can't, I'd like to let you retake it. We let them do retakes. And I honestly do nine out of 10 kids don't even, they sometimes hurt their grade. They don't even oh, improve really? it. Yeah. If you allow them to redo it, because they, they don't go home and restudy it and they just think their magic are going to get it. And then do you think, some of though, it'll help though. Because you're teaching high school. Do yeah. you think, Part of that, though, is because maybe that's a new concept to them. And they're, they're already have kind of had that learned helplessness of, well, I've been failing tests my whole life. Oh, like, God. Learn, learned helplessness is, is, a, is, a, is a plague. Yes, it, it's, it's awful. It's, it's hard to watch. Like, I teach the REI sections, which I should know what it stands for. But <laughs> I meaning, love, I uh, love re- it. Response, response so, so, and something, I don't forget the E, response something intervention. <laughs> I have my, I teach the inclusion classes where 30 to 40, upwards of 50% sometimes now of my classes have kids with IEPs ranging from the high to the lows of cognitive ability to emotional disorders to LD to whatever. Probably the most percentage of them, ADD plays a big role in it. Yes, those kids are, they're all great kids. They all try and do that. They all try and have their, their rhythm and their way of interacting with the class to where the learned helplessness comes into play. I, can, I won't use names, of course, but I can think of a couple times where somebody, me, another teacher, kind of motivated the kid to try for him try for him right not really i wouldn't say like you tried how you should be trying and then you give the test back or you run it and you see the grade is still bad and you're like dang it like i you know it, that's going to defeat him and you give it to him and he deflates and then you're just yep yep i saw that one coming but a lot of them though at the at the level of the high school i don't know i, I don't know if they're I got into the inclusion thing thinking like they have all these resources on their side, all these things outlined to try and help them in any way, shape or form. I'll work with them with my personality. I'll get through it and we'll overcome adversity. A lot of the kids just are poo poo. Like they're just, they, (sighs) they are, they know, I feel like they know who they are. They are what they are. And I want to let them be them. But at the same time, they can have a you one kid in regular of an IEP kid or just a normal kid like me. Which looking back, I was a class clown. <laughs> a normal kid, yeah, like no, you. whatever. Yeah, normal is the right <laughs> whatever word we're going to use. A non-identified student um, can have just such a profound impact on the learning environment. To where I understand you can't sit still. I get it. Like it's very difficult for you to sit still, but you got to try. You got to give me. You know, I'll give you two inches. You give me one. As opposed, to I'll give you two. You take six and just keep running with it. But then. It's just hard. I mean, education is a, is a huge endeavor. That's why I, I took it on where I realized early on in life that kids have to spend so much of their lives in here. I, I wanted to set up an environment to where they can be comfortable. Like if I, I thought I could do it to the level where I could try and get a kid to, eh, whole felt's class, I can deal with that. Because you're not going to get every kid with an A. You know, not every kid wants that. But if I can get a kid excited, just coming out of the class feeling okay about something, that's, I guess the mission is accomplished. But it's scary. It's a, it keeps me awake at night, to be honest with you. It really, it really does. The last few years have been really challenging with the, just the wide array of endeavors from the top down versus with the plethora of kids and what kind of has a, we're struggling with a, our poverty levels increasing and that mm. has a direct, I don't know. I've never, I've seen, I've seen research that there's a pretty parallel direct correlation between test scores and poverty levels. Well, and sure. Your basic lunches. needs aren't being met. Yeah. You don't, Give a crap about mm-hmm. you know the, the higher level stuff that, that teachers are trying to teach you. You're, oh, yeah. you're worried about what am I going to do for dinner? Yeah, which why, how could how could I expect you to believe that? We we you realize so fast you have no clue where some of these kids come from. I had one kid where my co teacher actually talked to him. She came up very upset and she's like, "I talked to so and so and he she's I was like, why do you why do you come here? You know you don't you get like a ten percent in class. It was bad, and he he just said that I I come here so I can eat lunch." He just, he just looks her straight in the eye and says, I come here so I can get a meal. And you're just, he was a sweet kid. He was a really nice kid. You're just, you're like, of course you don't care what a mitochondria is. <laughs> like, like, why would you? 
And then like, does, uh, is that is mitochondria serve with fries? Then yeah, I'll be interested. Right, right. I mean, I could tell you how. In essence, it's your metabolism and why you have energy. But you know, whatever, whatever. But uh, yeah, it, it's crazy. <laughs> it's a it's a crazy endeavor. But it's 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 a big system that's trying to get through to every kid, which we can't. But then just the ripple effects of trying to take all these different circles and layer them into one, where not every kid's the same, and helps one hurts two, helps two hurts one. You know, it's just this. I don't even know if there is a greater good. It's just it's mm. just a huge, huge thing to partake in, which will never function at its highest level, which is a is a challenge for me. I, I struggle with anything in life. I'm not good at doing something halfsies or I don't want to use the word mediocre, but just yeah. like being okay with okay. I, like, I, I just I struggle that, with it. I know that I do. I, I struggle whenever I'm working with a client and I'm just like, why am I not getting the results that I mm-hmm. like? Like this is, you know, this, you know, a certain clients not responding to it. So like I'm, I will try a hundred different approaches until uh, you know I can connect and reach the clients. And sometimes there are certain people who just at that point in time aren't ready, you know, for the work that I want to do with them. For sure. You know, when I'm working with kids, that when when I do have that kind of situation, then I'll focus more on working with the parents because you know these these oh, the yeah. education Huge. pieces, I, I, I mean, which, is so, a, which is so yeah. important. What we're gonna do right now, we're gonna take a real quick break. When we come back. We are going to, uh, I think we're going to talk about um, mindfulness, and um, I think we're going to geek out over podcasting. (laughs) Right on. All right, we'll be right back. This podcast is brought to you by ADHD Rewired Coaching and Accountability Group. Next session begins in early May. To see how much you can save by signing up before March 1st, go to coachingrewired.com. Hurry, because this price won't last, and it will only be given to the first six people who sign up before March 1st. Go to coachingrewired.com and prepare to get your ADHD rewired. Boom. Boom, 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 boom. Audible. Trial.com slash ADHD Rewired. For your free download. Go to audibletrial.com slash ADHD Rewired for your free audiobook download. All right, we are back with Alex Hofeld, who is on winter break in my office. Uh, Alex educates our youth of America. (laughs) (laughs) I try, I try. Um, so you, uh, so we were talking about mindfulness and you have brought mindfulness into the classroom. Yeah. I'd like for you to kind of tell me a little bit about that. I've dabbled. It, it, it's, it's, we, we have, I've gotten people on board with it, which is cool. Our, our school is very, we're open to stuff and, um, dealing with it myself, going through these things. And then, you know, we're talking, if we talk later about podcasts, it's just this mindfulness thing is just everywhere. It's just exploding all over the place. And then for me, it's always something I, one of my tenants in life is they're smarter people than me. So if I look up to you and you do things that I think are admirable, I'm going to, I want to know why, you know, that's why I'm a, I love podcasts. I want to learn from you. So I started playing with it myself a little bit more, trying to help out and do this. And then I ended up, um, we, I, I kind of partook in it a little bit. I did like box breathing exercises with the kids and I looked, it looked like they liked it. And it really came into play with... Te- you know, te- teach, if, do you want to give us a quick uh, a box breathing lesson oh, for, sure. for listeners? Box breathing is pretty simple. So you just sit up really so straight. So it's going to be a good like, see, can, can you uh, teach a, something that sort of has a visual element to it or yeah. an audio? Sure, sure. Here, here's your, your, your podcasting uh, lesson by fire. Here you go, <laughs> Alex. No pressure. <laughs> this one's about as simple as it gets. So you just start by sitting upright. You don't need to worry about rigor of sitting up. Everyone always thinks you need to be in full lotus pose with your hands and peace fingers and oming and stuff. And it's it you don't. So you just sit up, you get comfortable, eyes are open, you can do this while driving your car. You just start by exhaling fully. And now you're gonna inhale for five full seconds. So you want to do it nice and slow. And at the top, you hold your breath for five. You then exhale for five and then hold for five and you repeat. So the cue it, it's just inhale. Hold, exhale, hold, and then you just repeat this for three to five cycles, followed by three full inhalations and exhalations, and that's about as simple as it gets. You can do that for as long or as short as you like, but 
anytime you need, you just sit up straight and just take in some deep breaths. And it's a simple thing. It just it allows you to get all the oxygen in, also the oxygen out. You'll learn as you practice it the the timing of the in- inhales and exhales are a little bit of a challenge, but it's something we do every day. You're stressed, you take in a deep breath. Do you add the element of um, where you kind of raise your hand on the up? So yeah. And then, you know, on, then you go over. So you're actually creating a box. Yeah, we usually do. I, I do that when I'm doing it myself. I'll do it on my finger. And mm-hmm. he, he, you you could see me where I, I was counting. I was counting off my fingers as I went back and, and, and forth. Here, when you were doing it, here's what I was thinking. That the listener is like, oh, my God, these pauses are painful. Yeah. And now Alex is five seconds or or about two and a half seconds. Yeah. And so if you're like, oh my God, these pauses are painful. The bottom, just, the bottom, when you exhale is the hardest, the bottom is the toughest. Just notice the, the two and a half seconds, you know, that was like four times. If that was like painful listening mm-hmm. to that <laughs> silence, just realize like it's, it's interesting where we're like how uncomfortable we can get with just a few seconds of silence. Yeah. yeah. And I just think it's when we get curious about it and that's part of what mindfulness is, is, is having that open awareness and curiosity for sure and it's a skill it's a skill more than anything and i i'm sitting here i am not i mean i have yet to hold on to a more than a week long regimented practice it's it's bad i'm embarrassed by it i went like i think five weeks i was in a really good that's awesome yeah and uh you know so listeners who've been listening for a while they know if if i've been talking about that i've been doing something really well for a while and then you don't hear me talk about it for a while you know it's because i fell off the (laughs) bandwagon so it's like i was in this really good meditation streak and i'm on like week two where i've kind of fallen off of it and it's like i think about it you know it's like because i know like when i get in that group how good it feels and all the the just the positive aspects of it for sure so you know I, i know that the good news about always restarting something is that it's, in a sense, it's almost easy to restart when you say, I'm just going to start at that basic three minute meditation. Sure. Or don't even time it or just start breathing. You know, like it's it's just, it, the, that's the challenge of the whole thing. And as being type A and being a competitor than I am, like you'll sit there like, God, I suck at this. Like, you know, and you're, you're getting mad at your brain, but it's just like anything. You learn to do it better. And then some days you sit down and no, I'm, this is not worth my time. I'm just going to get up and I'm not going to beat myself yeah. up over it. And other days you, 20 minutes go by and you're like, whoa, there it is. You know? Yeah. I, I love when I sit down to meditate and I, and I haven't done it for a while and I know exactly like what I'm in for. Mm-hmm. I'm just going to watch how busy my mind is. Yeah, sure. And Which is mindful. Right, That's mindfulness. Right, exactly. Right. Because, you know, I've got, I had, I've had those experiences where I'm frustrated that I, you know, my, my thoughts just keep like bombarding me. Mm-hmm. And when you kind of let it just be. And it's okay. My, so my brain's gonna that, be busy. That's where just being critical of it. That that's where I decipher the difference between meditation and mindfulness. I think the two are two kind of different worlds. Being a you know registered yoga teacher, it was a very elaborate, very elaborate training we went through. Two hundred hours of. I mean, Saturdays I sat in a studio. I don't want to talk about it. For like twelve straight hours on a hardwood floor to where you know everyone's in these lotus poses and athlete type me is like I need a lawn chair. Can't sit on this ground anymore. But anyway, so my meditation is it, it it intimidates me. This idea, like true meditation, is the absence of thought, to where it's just the yogi always come like come back to your breathing, always back to your breath. Like the idea is that you're thinking of nothing. That's really hard. Mm-hmm. I find that to be very difficult. And anyone who's into meditation, and I'm I'm assuming mindfulness would turn into it. You know, mm-hmm. as you got better at it. I always present the mindfulness with the kids because it's just easier to hang on to. And you ever heard of Tara Brock? Mm-hmm. So I was just listening to some of her stuff again. And she just said it's, it, she calls it the, our relationship with reality. You know, and that's something that I really, I like. There's so many misnomers and it's cool exercise just to look at all the different definitions of it because it's all over the board. But just this idea, exactly what you're saying, where you're just with your thoughts. And there's this good app called Headspace I use. Yes. Have you seen that one? Yeah, I, I've seen the app and I actually listened to the audio book. Yeah. Um, actually, I have uh, it. I will. Uh, what's it called? Um, from the Headspace guy or from yeah, Tara? Yeah. Yeah, I don't know. I didn't even know he had one. He's got a cool backstory. His backstory is fascinating. Oh, it, it's, yeah. it's very fascinating. And he's like a CEO that turns into a, just goes into t- Thailand or something. Yeah, and then he, like, back then and he like escapes from his monastery. 10 plus like, years yeah. or something. Yep. Uh, no, he's, he, he, I think he has a TED Talks too. Probably. I yeah. can't think of his name right now either, but yeah, um, he's, he's oh, got man. some good stuff. He's got like a British accent. Mm-hmm. Um, totally. I, I wish I could tell you his name because yeah. then, then I can tell. The Headspace guy. Right. You know, the Headspace people know what we're guy. talking about. It's a um, really popular app right I think, now. I think it's actually called Get Some Headspace. I think is the name of, right. his, of his book. That sounds right. Um, and it's available on Audible, which you can get for free um, by going to audibletrial.com slash ADHD Rewired. 
maybe I should re-listen to that because yeah. I know whenever I'm trying to like rebuild like those habits, like when I when I um kind of fell out of my exercise routine, I know that I have to like reread the book Spark, um, which is all about like the neuroscience pan exercise. Cool. I would like, like that. After yeah, I read I that, that I was like, I can't not exercise and I can't not like strongly encourage it as part of the treatment package for sure. ADHD because it's like, yeah, when you understand the why, it's not, you know, I exercise for my brain, not for my body. Mm-hmm. So let's, let's get out on podcasting a little bit. Sure. So you said that, that it was one of your life dreams to just be on a podcast. <laughs> so I, I, I think it's awesome that I am, I feel like I'm like the the celebrity on the Make a Wish Foundation. <laughs> totally, you know, thank you, thank you. <laughs> Except, fortunately, you're not dying, so that's <laughs> that's good. Um, so you know, you've been wanting to do a podcast for a while, and now you've you've gotten a little bit closer. Mm-hmm. So, mm-hmm. tell me like, where where you're at, what your ideas are. I I just I I marvel at. I mean, we live in a world now. There's this second is the highest amount of information ever given to mankind in the history of the world, and it'll continue to grow. In terms of like for my brain, it's a singularity. It's this, you know, the internet started, it expanded. So it just podcast is just out there to just any information you want. It's just at your fingertips. And I don't listen to music much. I mean, like I told you, it's, it's, I think we're up was like $1,100 in three years on Stitcher, not counting audiobooks, tons of audiobooks, all this stuff. So for me, I, I would, I just love, I thrive on conversation. Mm-hmm. So I would love to just join the conversation. And for what I'd like to accomplish with mine, at first I was going to do the fitness world, but that's enough of that. Like I, if you need that stuff, I got you, I can help you. I can help myself and stuff. But what I'd love to see is I, I want to start, I want to somehow convey what I can, what I tr- attempt to do in my class when I'm off topic, when I'm rambling and ranting, however you want to put it to where I want to throw out there to the world This thing that has always stuck with me about the deeper I get into science, the more layers I peel back on whatever topic it is I'm looking at, the more stoked that makes me to be alive. And in reality, that's that's what I'm trying to do with anything in my life from health, wellness to fitness to teaching. I'm just trying to get you just I want you to be pumped on who who this is, what we are, all of it. So I've always wanted to take that angle. And I mean, anything from I could, you could geek out on water, you can geek out on, you know, sunlight on star on stars on I mean, talk about the epiphanies I had when I first started teaching astronomy and found out that all the elements were made in stars, you know, just these moments, like there's three or there's probably four I can remember in my life that were pivotal moments of just like, what? (laughs) So I'd like to do that. And then on a more the, the quote, I was at Carl Sagan that said, "We are made of star stuff." Yeah, we're all we're yeah. all made of star stuff. There's, I mean, quotes are endless from him, billions and billions. He's well. Speaking of that, he, I give this, I give this talk to where if you ever, I'll, I, I'll put it on YouTube sooner or later. I guess you call it a talk. It's my empty the empty the tank moment. I teach astronomy, and it's a semester long course. Astronomy. Yeah, it's I like it better in biology. Don't tell bio because that's what I have my bachelor's degree in, but. Have you ever seen Pale Blue Dot from Carl Sagan? Have you ever read that? Mm-mm. Okay. Dear God, I'll, I'll give it to you. <laughs> it, it's, it's Voyager went out, took a picture of Earth from Saturn. It's this speck. And mm-hmm. he wrote this, an entire book about it. There's one expert in, expert in particular that if everyone listened to and watched, the world would be a different place. I, I just I will I will go to war over that. That's a pretty bold. It statement. really it truly is. It truly is. But it's just it's hard not to just resonate. And you give it to the kids, and they're just they're they're quiet. You know, you just see that effect it has. So I give this speech talking about all these things, and one of the other keystones of it is Neil deGrasse Tyson's quote to where he was. Um, I think he was Time Magazine's Science Man of the Year, something with Time. They interviewed him, and the interviewer just casually kind of throws out there, "What's the most astounding fact?" And he's like, "What? What's the most?" And he's like, "Yeah, what's the most astounding fact you've ever learned?" And regardless, this is a dude who, if you read his backstory, I'm fascinated by him. He's, I'd love to meet him one day. He would. He, he was recruited by colleges. Like Carl Sagan actually picked him up at a bus stop at Cornell to try and get him to come to Cornell. But he picked Harvard because the back of Scientific America, most of them are from Harvard. So he's like, I'm going to go there. So this is like a, you know, a wicked bright man. And he goes into this huge, I won't ruin the speech for you, this wonderful speech about what his most astounding fact is. So I would love, I could answer that question multiple times. I would love to just be able to put people on a podcast and just throw that out to people. Like from any walk of life, from a professor to a cop to a mom to a, a, a kid. I mean, you know, I'd love to do it with the students. You know, I've always wanted to know. I always think of them as my audience. And as teachers aren't, if we're not figuring out what they like to listen to, we're, that's who I care about. I'm performing. I mean, science teaching is a performance art to me. 
So I would love to just throw that out to people for twofold. A, I would, you know, personally, I would just love to be a part of the conversation. I mean, you'd just, you'd grow as a human just being able to partake in that. And then I just think that would give you such an awesome database. Like if you really could correlate that, and I don't know if people have, I don't think anyone's ever really gone that angle, but as an educator, I mean, man, what a, what a great spin on that. You know, like you would just, as, as a teacher, just be like, well, this is, I did 200 people. Probably never even get that. You know what I mean? I, however so many Alex, people. I, I got to tell you this. So just the, the grin on your face <laughs> yeah. as you describe this is excited. so big. <laughs> you have to do this. Uh, so, so scary. Let me ask so you scary. this. What is the most amazing fact that, oh, that you God. ever learned? Oh, man. Oh, I didn't think we were going to put it on the spot. It's all connected. Like everything from the biggest to the smallest is just circles upon circles. And... I, I I cannot remember the exact m- what we were truly talking about. I remember vividly. I was at Western Illinois near the last, probably the last semester of my college before student teaching in genetics, which I'd put off forever. Oh, God, I do not remember what we were talking about. Something clicked and something was spe- said to me. And I just like a wave was just slapped in the face of everything that I've learned in school. All of it is connected, like top to bottom, side to side, biology, physics and chemistry come together for this. So those circles upon circles, and then it would have to honestly be just the human body. Like, you know, I, I teach the big and the small. It's the fun to teach in astronomy is I get the huge, I get the macro and I get the micro. Mm-hmm. And just the more, the smaller, the bigger space gets, the smaller you feel. So my big talk at the end of the year is all about, but that the smaller I am, the more significant it makes me feel. So just the most astounding thing would just have to be how it's it's just all connected. It's all made of this. You, again, this is from a science angle. There's other facets of society that would disagree, but it's like it's all just from this point of infinite mass and density that expands outwards over 13.7 billion years and over time correlates into this 5 billion year old star that has this tiny little orb going around it that somehow co-accretes and coalesces into this walking, talking, thinking, feeling me that can interact with the microphone and create this technology to take what's in my brain and the thoughts, feelings, emotion and shove it out to the world. And then it'll now hit you hopefully and resonate inside you. I mean, just, that's what it, it's just, I could, again, I could keep going here, but when you were saying, so I, this, um, this morning I had a, a very fascinating conversation with my son, who's four, yeah. who is like right now obsessed with text messaging, mm-hmm. and because um, he just he'll send it to like my my uh, my my parents or my in laws or me, just because he likes the whole notion of like he can tap some stuff in and then it gets something will get sent back yeah. to him, and he says, "I want my message to fly to your phone, but how does that happen?" Yeah, right. And I was like, "What an awesome question!" Totally. Totally. I was just like, oh man, I just love the way his brain works. Yeah. Now you can, now you can, you could, you could, you could look it up together. You know, you could find the. There's no more like, there's no more. You any answer question you have, you can have answer now, which is like, it's like Spider Man with great power comes great responsibility. Like that's a gift and that. a curse, right? Yeah. yeah. So that that's as a science teacher, that's what we try and that's the hardest part is like, how do you facilitate that? Like if I, I joke with my kids all the time, I'd get in trouble, but I I want to rip the glossary out of all my textbooks and to have like a glossary burning party. Like, we'll just throw the glossary in the book and just all bold face words. I'll rip out and just, yeah, I, I want, for me, we were talking about this at the Chad group. I want the textbooks to go away because I want to teach the kids how to use the internet for good. And how did, but what what happens is they'll go on and they'll just ask it a question. And then it's Yahoo, Eha, Wiki answers. I'm like, guys, this, this answer, this could be answered from a dude in his basement surrounded by cats eating Cheerios, you know, and like, you now think this is fact because you found it on, you know, Yahoo, which it may be. The guy probably has a wonderful opinion, but. So, yeah, hey, what was just, the thing you said yesterday about about Wikipedia? Which part? I think you said oh, something. that I'm just a walking, talking Wikipedia. Oh yeah, totally. Or, anything think, that comes out of our face, anything that comes out of my face, could be looked up on Wikipedia. <laughs> all of it. I mean, there's really nothing in terms of content. Nothing that is not. I mean, I look at Wikipedia to get my lessons ready. <laughs> you know, like it's just. But it's how to how to utilize that. But like how what your son did there that that's that's the goal as an educator and as a dad facilitate that you know like let's figure it out what an awesome question yeah i, I love it's it just love it. The, these kids it comes back to mindfulness they're just your body and your mind are just two separate entities sometimes to where you're i try and get through to the kids that your body's going to go from this room back to lunch in a straight line left foot right foot it's not it's going to breathe 
It's going to move. It's going to grab your sandwich. you remembered to eat lunch yeah, right? or, or if your queue is at 4 p.m. Like, <laughs> oh, my God, I'm starving. Oh, yeah, I forgot to eat lunch. There you go. There you go. Which is where I'm at right now. Right. <laughs> but you don't even realize that your body is going to go the amount of infin- infinite circles and cycles that brain will go through between the auditorium and back to lunch is infinite, right? So that's what it's about is this, you know, this idea of reality, again, is bringing the two together. And I like I like presenting it to the kids. We're like, you don't like authority. You know, you don't like anyone telling you what to do. Like, why let your mind tell your body how to feel? You know, like, let's get these both things. If there's anything you can control, control this. Because the idea of foresight is really I had this epiphany. It's probably not epiphany. Dealing with some of my kids who are struggling at the end of the semester and they're they're shut down. And all I wanted them to do was I wanted them to get the three days I gave them in class to study really hard to see what they could do on their final. Then we talk. I mean, these kids are they're failing. But I realize I don't think all students I don't think I did either. They don't have a lot of foresight. He didn't real these these kids didn't quite grasp. And I was trying to get through to him like your only option right now. The only thing you have control over is you study for the next two days. Then that'll permeate into a grade. That grade then can facilitate a conversation. However, you sit here and do you, that you know the outcome. The outcome is it's set in stone. You will fail the final, you'll fail the class, you'll retake it. Like, so your only option right now is to try. It's all you can control. You know, I just, I, I, I've already failed. Nope. I'm not I'm telling you you haven't. I'm telling you you can do one thing though. I'm not just going to give it to you, you know. And I just, like, I was looking at them. I don't know if they, I don't, they didn't think of it that way. It's just so. It's this. It's you know they don't see the they don't. It's like the trees in the forest of the forest and the trees, right? And, yeah. And that's that's a challenge. That's just something for everybody. You know, that's that's the idea for all of it is seeing the greater good of. You think of sorry if I'm rambling here, but if you, I realize that sometimes teaching yoga and doing yoga, you'll get in there and we want to rush to the end of the class. Like you want to rush to like the end of the accomplishment. I took the class, and you look at your watch and like because yoga is a very slow. CrossFit's different. You just fire it up and yeah. run through it and you're done. It's easier. So yoga, you got to sit with yourself. And it's almost like why I've laid out this hour and 15 minutes. Why not enjoy this hour and 15 minutes? Why it should be the opposite. I should be like, man, I, this is going to end soon. Dang it. We're feeling so good. I'm sweating. I'm here. We go the other way. Mindfulness is the same thing. I sit down. I'm like 10 minutes, 10 minutes relative to the rest of my day. And I'm like, come on, 10 minutes. Come on. You know, you're like peeking out the corner of your eye at the headspace app at the little wiggly circle. But in reality, I should be like, I have these 10 minutes. Like, what a power. Like, yeah. that's a gift. And that's how it's hypocritical. I mean, I struggle with it every day, but that's the idea of how to get people to see these things. And the kids are just, they don't realize it because I don't think anyone's given it to them. And for the kids, we've never quite, I was telling you earlier, I, I'm always horrified and amazed by kids. Always and forever will be. It's just humans in general. And I think you're, you're horrified by humans and yeah, just like the good, the bad, and the ugly, right? you know, like, and we think, and when I started doing this, I was terrified because I thought the kids were going to, I was like, Oh, it'd be awkward. It's hard as the teacher sometimes without, you know, it's, it's not tough being me, but <laughs> you have to sit there with the silence. Right. And you, that's my, that's the challenge with as a talker in yoga class was mind bending to me. Cause I'm sitting there and I have to talk. You got to be the next, the next, the next, the next, the next, the next, the next for an hour and 15 minutes yeah. where other stuff teaching even is just like, all right, you get downtime. You're rarely ever on for an hour and 15 minutes. So I'm sitting there and I'm thinking these kids are going to giggle. They're going to laugh. They're going to squirm. They're going to jump. They're going to they're going to balk at it. They're going to make fun of me, of it, of the person next to them. Nope. I'm telling you right now, none. So any teacher who's looking at doing mindfulness, they are not going to do that. And if they and do, I, they I, won't I, show up, you know? I have heard that many oh, times. Oh, they're hungry for it. Where hungry it's for it. brought into the schools and like the, the same thing. The teachers yeah. are like, I don't know what they're going to go for. And they eat it up yep. and they ask for it. And mm-hmm. yeah, to- so oh, Completely. They ask for it all the time to the point where I feel bad I can't give it to them more. Like I'd love to, we have lunches. It'll never happen. It, it won't. But I would love for it to be where my schedule gets. That's the priority. If I'm the guy who you trust to do it to where I could have lunches off to where it would be a self self-fulfilling what's the word self-advocating thing mm-hmm. where you could decide like i need a little bit of downtime tuesdays and thursdays mr hofelt's offering this i'll skip my lunches whatever you know and give it to him as opposed to this regimented thing to where it'd be great if i was there to be like mr hofelt i, I need this today hey let's come and, and then i bet you if they did if you guys did a pilot study mm-hmm. that it would show the students who participated in that i bet you see an increase in grades a decrease in in uh, referral stuff uh, to the oh, social yeah, worker yeah. and I mean, it's there's just so many profound benefits to sure. to the practice. And the of, research is out yeah. there. Harvard just published, a, I think it was Harvard, just published a study where it was, it was like two weeks of, of it 
it rewired the brown matter in your brain or something like gray matter, whatever. Whatever it, color it, it is, yeah, right? You're it, colorblind, it, it, so you don't showed, really know. What you know it, they have the fMRI scanners right, now, and it, right. it showed an, a change in the actual composition yes. of your mind. What? Yes. Like that's just right. come on. Right. Like, well, there's, that's a there's a study that there was an eight-week study. One of the I think one of the the first kind of big studies that was used by I think the Marines mm-hmm. that it was an eight-week um, uh, uh, structured uh, mindfulness-based stress reduction uh, training program, yeah. and they showed they did pre and post. Um, uh, fMRI studies and they showed structural change in yeah. the brain in over eight weeks. You know, so it's and, and they follow some of these these, uh, these um, uh, troops and they had in their in their divisions they have like less fatalities, yeah. less um, uh, civilian casualties. I'm just it's it's amazing how much a second can actually benefit us. Well, they say upwards like pause, three minutes even. Yeah, that's what that, that if we, we keep going here. That that's where I I try and go into more of where. It's even intimidating because you feel the pressure to crush. You got to go teach bell to bell to where I'm starting to think like I want to get like a little singing bowl in there. And every, you know, we're going to go from introducing the introducing the directions to the lab, hit the bowl when it resonates. Now we move. Right. And like the mindfulness breaks, the breathing breaks and stuff like that mm-hmm. is is that's where it can be so simple. Just so, so easy. And like. I don't know. It just comes back to this idea that the kids blew me away by that. And for many things that they do, they usually, they usually surprise you for good. Every once in a while they let you down, but, and they, they're, they're, they're more hungry for it than like, we can do that mindfulness thing, you know? And I felt like when I first started, I felt like I'd like kick down the door and be like, yo, 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 we're doing some mindfulness. Like trying, but uh, you know, just like they, they're and, a little and skeptical. Then, and, and, and then your, your students should be like, um, Mr. Hallfeld, you take it down please notch. don't ever do that again. Yeah, right? <laughs> They'll call you out. They'll call you out on everything for sure. It's like, for sure. Mr. Hallfeld. Don't ever call us dude again. Yeah. <laughs> they're pretty funny. I, I love it. I'm like working with like a teenager and like, you know, I was like, you try to kind of be hit with them and they're like, no. Yeah. And they just totally just like call you out. I was like, all right. They're pretty, they're usually pretty critical of it. Yeah, they're they're lot, usually, I try I to tell them like, though. you can say good hair, your hair looks good today. Don't tell me it looks bad. Just let it go. You know, <laughs> like just, just let it ride. So they're, they're funny though. They're good. I don't, I love them. Obviously, otherwise I wouldn't do the job that I do. Well, we do have to uh, bring this to a close. Alex, what is fast. there, is there uh, any, Anything else that you want to share uh, with with the listeners? Any final messages? Just don't be afraid. Try and partake in this mindfulness exercises with yourself and with your kids, your friends, your family, your your students. If you're a teacher, just try it first for yourself. It, it, there are a plethora of stuff. Download Headspace, super easy. Tara Brock. I mean, you really don't need to fear it because there's so many. Just do a guided one. It's not weaker. I thought that was like, oh, I sh- as, a, as a yoga teacher, I thought like I should be able to do this myself. No, it don't, you don't need to. Someone else is better at it than you are. You'll get better at it in time. Don't be afraid of it. Don't be intimidated by it. Try it. Give it, set set a goal to try it just a minute a day, you know, just five deep breaths, whatever. And it'll, it'll permeate. It'll, it'll resonate with you and keep going. But yeah, it, it works. And just, just be aware. And then in terms of ADD and all that stuff, just, it's real. Just, you know, help, <laughs> help each other out. We're all, be, what's the one quote? Be kind for all or fi- fighting a hard battle or something from Plato. I always resonate with that one where, you know, be aware of it, but at the same time, do everything in your power to focus on the good instead of the bad. Like, don't get defeated by the bad and just, but don't let it control you, you know? Like, make sure that you're working, working towards overcoming whatever it is you got to overcome just because we're all trying to do our best. Alex, well, thank you very much for spending the hour. Thank you. That uh, was fun. W- with me and, and with the listeners and, uh, now, Alex just helped us get our ADHD rewired. Wait, it's not over yet. You remember at the very beginning, I said I was going to play a clip uh, for you of Alex's podcast, which is now out on iTunes. His podcast is called Beautiful. What is it called? I always mix up the name, the, the order of the. Ah, it's called. Beautiful dust specs. Um, don't think because I don't remember the name, I don't think it's awesome. I think it's so awesome that I'm throwing in here like a five minute clip of the second episode. And uh, here it is. Enjoy. Hey, what's up, team? Welcome back to episode two of Beautiful Dust Specs. Thanks for tuning in last week, you excellent, weird, wild, wondrous, yes, wandering dust specs, you. You beautiful, gorgeous, bizarre, fantastic, fearful, and foreboding dust specs. You infinitesimal, atomic, microscopic, minute, minuscule, yet colossal dust specs, you. You beautiful little thing. So... 
I am a teacher. I teach high school science. I teach yoga. I teach CrossFit. I teach whatever anyone wants to listen to. Sometimes I have to actually be aware that people don't want to learn stuff all the time. That's not me. I want to learn constantly. I'll sit down with anybody who can teach me something from any perspective, as long as it doesn't get super crazy. I'm just kidding. The crazier, the better. So I'm thinking about learning, and I'm thinking about my students out there in the weird, weird, weird world that is high school, all the stuff flying at them from every direction, and probably the thing they like least is learning, right? We were all at school. I was not a good student. I became a teacher to be better than my bad teachers. So for all my teachers out there, if you, I should give you more gratitude. Maybe I'll email you one day. You were great. All my bad teachers, you taught me something too, which is all good. But I remember going home as a student, and your mom would be like, did you learn something today? And you're like, yeah. Learn something, you know, no big deal. Where in reality, I never really thought about what does it mean to learn? Even if you're learning something small like the name of the person next to you or something big like cellular respiration or the size and scale and composition of anything around you, science... It's amazing. It's more than amazing. It's a superpower. I love joking around with my students where they're obsessed with the Marvel Universe and all these dark horses and DC comics and all this stuff that's out there. And we're more superpowerous than any other creature on the world. Just made that word up. Enjoy the ride. So, learning. Neuroplasticity. We're sponges. We are these little creatures that have this huge thing in our head that we call our brain. It's truly what separates us from all other things on the evolutionary ladder. The entire existence of creatures that exist today range in 35 million species, plus or minus. But in reality, that's only 1% of all the creatures that have ever existed on this globe. And there's only one of those, one creature, one species of homo sapien, homo sapien, homo sapien, Homo sapien, there we go. I'll get it right. See, I'm learning. I'm getting my tongue tied here, which is speech is a different topic. And it'll come up in this one. So this brain is three pounds. It's made up of 75% water. It's actually 60% fat. So those of you guys that eat a low-fat diet, talk to me sometime about Bulletproof Coffee and why it's good for you. It makes up 2% of your entire body. It actually eats and requires 25% of the total calories that you ingest in a day. We'll talk about digestion another time, the fact you can just take food and shove it into your face hole and, you know, metabolism takes place. It's insane. So it's huge. It's really, really, really big relative to the body. It's the biggest brain relative to body mass of any creature that's out there. The stats on it can get pretty staggering pretty you know, pretty quickly. We'll talk about the universe. We'll talk about biology. We'll talk about whatever. But the universe is huge. We talk about scale a little bit last year. There's a billions. I'm not even ready to tell you yet. I'll save it for another episode and really drive it home. There's a lot of galaxies and there's a lot of stars. In the Milky Way galaxy alone, there's a hundred trillion stars. And I may tell you there could be billions of galaxies. You're not ready for it. Just just hang on to that for a later episode. So inside our brain, though, there's over 100 trillion neurons, 100 trillion neurons, these crazy little cells that don't really divide. They're with us from the beginning as our brain bl- as our brain like grows and adapts as the days go on. But in that 100 trillion neurons, there's anywhere from 1,000 to 40,000 synapses per neuron, tiny little gaps that neurotransmitters will jump across. I mean, in essence, that's happiness, that's serotonin, that's dopamine, and that's these ways that our body learns these things. That's incredible. If you break that down and do the math on that, that means there's more neurons inside your head than there are stars, not in the galaxy, but in the universe. Your brain is a universe. Many people have stated that we understand more about the universe that we really don't understand that much about than we do our human brain, the thing that is allowing us to understand the universe, right? It's the thing that allows us to create the word think to personify what the brain is doing. You sit here in your chair and you can think about thinking. You can ponder pondering. You can wonder your ability to wonder, right? You can flip that over on itself as many times as you like. It's kind of a fun exercise. Sit there and think about yourself thinking. Think about yourself thinking about yourself thinking. Think about yourself thinking about yourself thinking about yourself thinking. I'm thinking that Beautiful Dustbex just got a few new subscribers. Hey, go leave him a, uh, a rating and review on iTunes because it will really help him. This is an awesome podcast. Enjoy it. Now, let's continue with the outro. 
Thank you for listening to another episode of ADHD Rewired. And if you're new to the show, welcome to ADHD Rewired. We are more than just a podcast. We are a community focused on learning, growing, and connection. You can see a full outline of this and all other episodes with all the links and other resources mentioned during this interview at ADHDrewired.com. Help support this podcast by checking out my sponsors. I use Zoom video conferencing nearly every day and so can you. Go free or go pro, but please go to erictibbers.com slash Zoom so they know that I sent you. And you can get a free audiobook from Audible at erictibbers.com slash Audible. And next time you shop Amazon, use the Amazon search portal at ADHDrewired.com. Com. A small percentage of your purchase will go to support this show, and it doesn't cost you anything extra. You can also support this podcast by leaving an honest rating and review in iTunes or Stitcher. This really helps other people find this show. And don't forget to hit subscribe so you never miss an episode. Don't just be a passive listener, be an active member of the ADHD Rewired community. We are on Facebook. You can like our page, but please submit your request to join our free and growing community. And don't forget to check your other inbox because I screen everybody before they come into our community. Looking for a coach? If you're still listening at this point and you answered yes, come to my website at ADHDrewire.com and schedule your free 20-minute consultation or... Call me at 224-993-9450. Is your school, business, or organization hiring speakers? I provide fun and engaging presentations full of practical solutions that both educate and entertain. Hire me for your next professional development day or corporate training event. Go to ADHDrewired.com slash talks. Thanks for listening. I'll catch you next week. So I asked Alex, how does he respond to people who say to him, ADHD isn't real. It's just an excuse. Shove it into your face hole.